Warning. The following podcast contains graphic content that may be disturbing or triggering to some listeners. Discretion is advised. The Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast is available free of charge thanks to the support of Cracked Armor. Their mission is to raise awareness for PTSD, TBI, and mental health to support those who struggle. By creating an army of warriors who represent the gear, their hope is that it will send a message to others that they are not alone. Go to crackedarmor.com. Say hi to Mark Long, read about the story, and find some research information about PTSD. And if you can, look good while supporting Cracked Armor by buying some gear. Ten nine. Did you say Papa Tango Sierra Delta? There's so much left to do, so many things I want to see and I see. Don't make the change. If it rains every single day, I'll fight to blow it all away. This is episode 23 of the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast. My name is Larry Payton, and I have been diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress. Yesterday, I was filling out some forms for VAC. These are forms that I've put off for a little while because, well, even thinking about them sort of put me in a bit of a shitty place. I knew I just didn't want to go down that path of thinking a lot of things again because ultimately... I try to push a lot of it out of my mind as best as I can. I mean, I deal with things piece by piece. I know I get overwhelmed when I try to take on too much. And so, yeah, I put it off. Yesterday, I got into trying to complete these documents. And I became overwhelmed. I mean, I guess just thinking about how many ways my life has changed because of my diagnosis. Things that I found easy before, things that didn't bother me before, changed. Trying to explain that I can't go into grocery stores or I can't be around busy places. I can drive a vehicle, no problem. But I know there's times I ought not to be driving a vehicle, such as heavy traffic, such as when Things are just busy in a particular area. I start to get agitated and frustrated by other people on the road, which is not a good place to be. Anyway, I was filling out these forms, and I'm just thinking again of all the shit, and fuck, it just puts me in a feeling of overwhelmed. I bring this up to you today because I want to share an article I read called Coping with Feeling Overwhelmed in PTSD Recovery. It was released August 11th, 2016 by Jamie Delo. Coping with feeling overwhelmed while in recovery from post-traumatic stress disorder can be challenging. I know when I became overwhelmed with anything, emotion, physical or mental, I am likely to just want to shut down and avoid life. My anxiety kicks in and it feels like everything is out of control, moving too fast, and I become irritable, whiny, and tired. Sometimes when that happens, I absolutely need a full stop, a nap or a good night's sleep to recharge and feel better. First and foremost, PTSD is an anxiety disorder, and anxiety and stress often cause feelings of being overwhelmed. It may feel like there is just too much to do, too much you haven't accomplished, or too many other people in your life who need your time and attention. For me, it's a feeling of being out of control and not knowing where to start to make things better. I become apt to just freeze or distract myself with something that allows me to escape the feelings. These are not healthy or productive ways of handling it. I know. Yeah, that hits home for me because I tend to get feeling overwhelmed. And that's a freaking horrible place. I don't like feeling overwhelmed, but it just puts me in a really bad spot. I go so quickly from feeling like I have things under control to starting to feel like things are getting out of control to feeling overwhelmed. And then it just seems to take one little more piece to set me off to get me into agitation again, frustration again. The reality is I can't do 
everything that needs to be done in a day. I can't do everything that I need to do in the next couple of weeks. So yeah, no matter where I look, there's always going to be chores. There's always going to be things that need to be taken care of, things that need to be fixed up. I need to do better at accepting that and knowing that I'm not failing by not getting it all accomplished in one day and know that it isn't all about needing to accomplish something every day and then earning relaxation as a reward. That's generally how I treat myself. I know I can do better. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on feeling overwhelmed, how you deal with it. Be great to know, great to learn, great to share. On this episode, you're in for a treat, a real treat. This lady is phenomenal. Great deal of respect for her. She's going to share a lot with you about PTSD. She's going to talk to you about why she feels the word trigger should not be used when you're speaking about PTSD. And she's going to ultimately tell you, well, I'll let her tell you. Let's take a quick break. This episode of the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast is brought to you thanks to the support and financial sponsorship of Cracked Armor. Go to crackedarmor.com, read the story, buy the gear, wear it, to send a message to others who are struggling that they're not alone. Also, check out Willow Tree Farm, care of Jason Subkowich, another member who is struggling with PTSD and who frequently updates his Instagram to share his story. You can follow him at Jason. Subkowich. That's Jason. Sierra Oscar Bravo Kilo Oscar Whiskey India Charlie Zulu. We are back from the break. Thank you very much for staying tuned to the Papa Tango Sierra Delta podcast. Today on the show, I would like to welcome Dr. Pamela Hall, also known on social media as Dr. Pam. Dr. Hall is a forensic psychologist and a clinical psychologist that has worked with a lot of veterans. She's also the author of a book called PTSD Unplugged, which I have recently read and quite enjoyed, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that a bit today. Pam, thank you for joining the show. Larry, thank you for sharing your platform. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm excited. A listener reached out and asked, I I had said tag any celebrities that you would like, and you were one of the ones that were tagged. And so I'm very happy that you took me upon the offer to join on the show. So that's awesome. I'm very excited to have you here today. I got a kick out of being identified as a celebrity. I don't see myself that way. (laughs) Yeah, I understand. um, But you know what? The social media business can raise your ability to speak to different groups of people about stuff you're passionate about. So I'm glad to be asked to come on your podcast. I've listened to several of the podcasts coming up to today, and it's just great to hear law enforcement folks talking about PTSD in the real language that they use on a day-to-day basis. It's what I hear all the time at work. It's the language that I speak PTSD in. So it works (laughs) for me real good. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, there was no language whatsoever, no foul language use at all. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Well, well, didn't quite meet that, but maybe, it's maybe. all good. Maybe. What's foul language? One, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's how we talk in the bullpen, I guess. And I don't know. It's just, yeah, that seems to be the natural way. All that said, Dr. Pam, if you could please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about you and your background. I am currently working as a forensic psychologist. What that means, I work in the area of injury and disability. So if someone has a court case related to a psychological injury, I might be asked to do an examination and weigh in on whether there's an injury or how severe the injury is and what it pertains to. In the workers' comp system, I've done some work with law enforcement or first responders more generally but actually more work with injured workers who have orthopedic injuries or other injuries that interfere with their ability to do their job. And then there may be mental health issues that come from that, like sleep disturbance because of the pain or discouragement or even depression because of the change in lifestyle that a work-related injury could cause. 
So I have done workers' comp type examinations. Again, same question. Is there an injury? How severe is it? What caused it? The dominant work that I've been doing since about 2008 is VA benefits exams in psychology. I work for a company called QTC Management, and I'm sure if you did a poll of veterans, there would be a mixed response about is QTC good or not good? Do they do a good job? <laughs> Look, I work for this company because because they let me do my job and they don't question my outcomes. You know, if I have a finding of a mental health condition that pertains to military service, I just have to make the forensic argument that this psychological injury has its beginning during military service. That pertains a lot to PTSD and this 20-year war that we've been in. So as I introduce myself, I would say that I have listened to war zone stories every week of my life since 2008. And in the course of time, I began doing more of these evaluations as our younger vets started, younger meaning under the age of 35, started coming forward with their PTSD claims from Iraq and Afghanistan. And as the sexual assault situation during military service became, well, men and women, uh, maybe I should say in that case, women and men started coming forward with more claims associated with having been assaulted during service. The tragic thing when uh, someone who's supposed to have your back takes advantage of that situation. So I've done now at this point um, 7,500 examinations. How about that? And that's just me going to work. So that's what I mean. I don't feel like a celebrity. I just feel like a doctor who has been going to work for 15 years and Seeing people explain and describe the impact of violence exposure on their mental health, their lives more generally. So this has been my work. But I think it comes down to the semantics of how it is you define celebrity. And so, you know, are you a screen actor? Okay, no. However, to people who struggle with post-traumatic stress or complex post-traumatic stress, TBI, you could arguably, I believe, be seen as a celebrity. I mean, I'm going to read a piece out of your book, PTSD Unplugged. And this is something that really resonated with me. And and so, I mean, after reading this, I'll be honest, Dr. Pam, I think you're a celebrity. It says, for others to say thank you for your service is not sufficient. You deserve to come home to a family and community ready to welcome you. You may not want to talk about it. It may make you feel worse than you feel when you try to shove those memories away but you will find peace after war when you can tell us what happened. I mean, that's huge. I mean, that says so much in just, what is that, three sentences in terms of thanking for service and how you should react to that, what you should come home to in terms of your expectations. But the reality as well is that as a person who is struggling with post-traumatic stress, keeping everything bottled inside and not sharing it, not talking about it becomes toxic as well for you and for your other relationships. Is that fair to say? Very fair to say. Yes, very fair to say. So my journey with this began, like I said, in 2008. I had a private practice at the time, and I was doing some of these examinations as part of my practice. And at that time, I was working quite a bit with the domestic violence community in San Bernardino, California. That's where I reside. San Bernardino County is the biggest county by square foot in the United States and the largest county by population in the United States. And we had a very strong domestic violence consortium. I was the chair of the consortium for a couple of years doing interventions from the side of the family survivors and from the side of a, a person who interacted with law enforcement because of a domestic situation. And you being in law enforcement, I know you know what I mean. So in in California, we started having a requirement if you were convicted of a domestic violence offense that you had to attend an anger management program. And so I was the operator of an anger management program for about 10 years. 
We had over a hundred participants and half a dozen group facilitators over time. We conducted groups in Spanish and English, working with the guys. And we also had a female group so that we could teach better skills for managing family conflict. We could talk about mental health issues and how they contribute to family conflict. One of the things that we weren't doing very well during that period, which was like the early 2000s, was talking to the people in our groups about what happened to them in terms of trauma exposure. So I've been watching this PTSD environment change as far as what practitioners know to speak about, about what people know to tell us about. And that was in the 10 years that I ran that group. I watched that evolve. It became something I talked about or asked about more later in the time of doing the groups than earlier. So I did those groups from 1997 to 2013. So I guess that's 16 years, isn't it? Sometimes the numbers just make you feel old. I'm with you 100% on that. (laughs) Yeah. So that was where I ended up getting involved with some veterans in these groups. And when I was Uh, Looking for some other ways to be involved in veteran interventions, I began to do these assessments. During that period as well, I that was the beginning of the critical incident stress debriefing movement where mental health providers would go into first responder organizations and talk about how to recover or how to respond when you're in a critical incident situation. This was how we first talked about post-traumatic stress disorder with first responders. So I would go in and do a training about what you might experience after a traumatic stress event and found that folks in these classes I was teaching were really not that interested. (laughs) It was the beginning of my awareness of the stigma about talking about these things straight up. This was in the early 2000s. So here we are 20 years later. And I can't tell you how much joy it brought me to hear first responders talking on your podcast about their experiences in a way to eliminate the stigma that this is just something that happens because of the tragedies that we encounter, that you guys encounter in your work. So thank you for your service. Thank you. The other thing I like to say is it's not right to say thank you for your service if you're not willing to listen to the stories, because that is how our community can come together. So very, very well said, and I agree. We'll come back to that because there's another quote in here. We talk about the importance of speaking out. I will say one of the things that I think is interesting is that your experience, I'll say, with the effects of combat occurred when you were 15 years old, when you had a relative that was drafted to Vietnam and came back and you noticed some differences in him. Yeah. So I was part of the family, of the extended family that had the younger girl cousins and the other families had older boy cousins. And so when I was in my teens, Each one of my older boy cousins was in the military. This was in the early 70s. One of my cousins, my favorite, he returned from Vietnam. He had been drafted, and he returned a year later, and we had a welcome home party for him. And I just will never forget his hands were shaking, and he could not look me in the eye. And he was not telling the jokes he was telling before he left for war. And, you know, I never saw him any better over the years that I saw him. And I think he was better in different ways. But whenever he was with the family, it was very hard for him to come into the family because of his experiences, because the family did not know how to gather around him. I didn't know at that age how to ask him what happened. I probably did because I've always been this person who is nosy 
or you might just say interested, <laughs> but you know, I would just ask him when we first were having these gatherings, but he didn't want to talk about it at all. So it was seven years later when I was in my first graduate degree that we opened up the new DSM from 1980, and there was this description of post-traumatic stress disorder. And I read that description in class, and I thought, oh, that's my cousin. And so that was my introduction to post-traumatic stress disorder. It was 1981. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing because I was into a conversation with someone today who was telling me his grandfather was one of the soldiers who landed on Juneau Beach and spent several years posted overseas during the Second World War. I started talking about my grandfather because I'm originally from Newfoundland on the east coast of Canada, and we had not yet joined Canada. We were still considered part of Great Britain, and so he served in the Royal Marines. The point I'm making is that we both talked for a while about things that we did not realize at the time about both of our grandfathers that now makes a lot of sense in terms of the sternness, in terms of not being around a lot of family gatherings, about being quiet a lot. There was a little bit of, I mean, he would get upset with things. He would take care of things around his property, but very, very upset if anyone touched it, messed with it, whatever. But I mean, it all makes sense now, which is, I guess, just to add on to what you said with regards to your cousin in Vietnam. These things we just never understood. I mean, for a long time, and one of the things I love about your book is that you also go through the history of what was originally known as, well, I mean, we go back to the Civil War, so I don't even remember that, but I I always knew it as combat fatigue or shell shock. But I mean, the issue of the personalities and mental capacities of soldiers coming back from war has been documented 200 years ago, just nobody really correlated it in terms of what exactly was going on. Is that fair to say? That is fair to say, but I would say that no one correlated it would be the medical community. Okay, yeah. I think families have always known what was going on. So in my research for the book, you know, I knew the general bones of where PTSD as a diagnosis came from, from the medical side, but I wasn't as familiar with the community or social side. And I really wasn't familiar with how long the medical community has been looking at the effects of traumatic stress exposure, of violence exposure, which dates all the way back to the beginning, really, of formal, let's say, quote, modern medicine, goes back to around the time of the Civil War. And I do a quick summary in my book, actually in the addendum, so you don't have to read it if you don't want to. (laughs) I think. But in the addendum of my book, I go through the history, beginning with like three threads of attention to trauma injury that were occurring in the late 1800s. The three threads were industrialized railway. So there were injuries that were occurring. They called it railway spine when they could see a pattern of post-traumatic stress that we think of post-traumatic stress symptoms. It was litigated in the 1800s. Then there was the Civil War. It was called Soldier's Heart at that time, and people were hospitalized for it. And in Europe, it was part of the psychoanalytic community of Freud, where women were talking about being sexually assaulted, and Freudian psychology developed around their stories. They didn't believe their stories. None of these stories were believed, actually. People from the very beginning were doubted in their report of these stories that we see patterned and predictable stories of sleep disturbance, accelerated heartbeat, high blood pressure, startle response, vigilance, this package of response to having been a survivor of a violent act. We saw it then. They were reporting it then. We didn't believe them then. And here we are in 2023, and all three of those things can still be said. That's why I wrote the damn book, (laughs) because I just couldn't be this long in the tooth in this career and not say my piece. So that's a big part of the motivation for the book. If people don't read the entire book, they're really missing out. So for those who are tuned in and listening to the podcast right now, Dr. Pam and I first met, had a good conversation on the phone just a couple of days ago. 
And at the end of the conversation, I decided yesterday I would buy the book and take a thumb through it. Well, I haven't been able to put it down and I finished it because I have learned so much about what is going on inside of me. Despite the fact that I've been working through this for a number of years, all of a sudden things are very clear. And that's because Dr. Pam speaks in language that is not overly clinical. She speaks in language that you will understand that as a survivor of a violent incident, you will understand what's being said. And it's going to connect a lot of dots and fit a lot of puzzle pieces together. Once you understand the impact the traumatic incident had on your amygdala, what shuts down in terms of the right side of your brain, what activates in terms of the left, why this leaves scars, why it becomes non-processed trauma incidents. And it goes into it so very clearly and succinctly that it's, I don't understand why people wouldn't read the book, Dr. Pam. It's, I thought it was phenomenal. I thought it was really, really good. Getting to the book, I'm going to say another thing here. I want to just quote and talking about, because I, I mean, the podcast is about getting people to talk about the struggles, but also understanding that there are people who are not yet ready to talk or cannot talk. And at the very least, they can listen and know they're not alone. I will say when it comes to talking, and this really stood out to me, this says one of the most harmful results of PTSD is the social isolation that arises when symptoms are active. Life is stressful for everyone at times, but for the individual with PTSD, stress comes from within, surprising everyone, and no one understands what is happening. Conversations may seem impossible, but they are vital for recovery. Once this is acknowledged, an appropriate ally can be found. That's deep. It again, in a few sentences, all of a sudden explains why I was not comfortable talking to certain people, why people don't understand that mm -hmm. I'm seeing things and I don't understand how they're not seeing them. It makes sense. Right. Uh, Dr. Pam, I would like you to talk because one of the things as well that we spoke about was some of the jargon. I know a frequent thing that comes up. I mean, there's two frequent things that come up with people I speak to who are struggling or who have family members that are struggling. One of them is they despise that it's known as a disorder. And the other one is they really dislike the term triggered, which we kind of addressed both of those the other day on the phone. So I would certainly love you to talk to both of them, but I love what your idea, well, what you call being triggered. Could you speak to that, please? So pet peeves that you develop over time, right? So the word trigger is kind of a pet peeve for me. So I feel like I get triggered sometimes when the car crosses in front of me on the freeway and I go from I'm driving calmly to what the heck are you doing with your vehicle right now, you know? And so I feel like most of us get triggered in one way or the other. We rise up and say, what the heck, you know, or we get triggered and something doesn't go right or, you know, we experience a depression, like a clinically significant depression. And then we become sad and we don't know why we're sad or we become anxious. We don't know why we're anxious. We worry about things. We don't know why we're worrying about things. And that kind of thing, I'm happy to use the word trigger for that. But for the person who has a post-traumatic stress response, what's happening is not that sort of a normal range of frustration or anger or sadness or is being triggered. It's that a memory is being activated. So I like the word activated and I use the word activators. And I believe that I developed this over time in a more... I don't even think I talk about activators in the book as much as I talk about it now because I am talking with so many different people, not just the people who come into my room or my office. I'm listening to them and also listening to other people speak about what's going on. And what you see when you see this in different people over and over again, so of the 7,500 exams, 6,000 of them are people who filed claims for PTSD. So why do I know that? Because I'm the kind of person who might count something like that just because I want to know. You know, it seems like a lot. Has it been a lot? Yes, it actually has been a lot. And those 6,000 people that I've borne witness to their description of what's going on inside of them 
And more so, I have borne witness to their activations. So in an appointment to do this kind of assessment, the event that occurred has to be discussed, which you know is the thing nobody wants to do. But because when they do, when a person discusses actually the incidents that occurred, they become activated. And they know very well that they're out of their skin at that point in time. You know, this is not like anything I've ever experienced before. When someone has an adult-related, like, first incident exposure to violence, it's even more clear. People who grow up in a violent home environment have more, this is why I like to say, complex PTSD, because there's more, it's not clearly caused by a single event. But when you see someone where something is caused by a single event, be that a war zone event or a criminal event or an assault of some kind as an adult with a relatively clean prior life, you can see how they go from being clearly themselves to clearly activated. And that activated state has all this self-protective mistrust of other people, feeling of anxiety, worry that they're not going to be able to take care of themselves, uh, they're not going to be able to prevent something from happening, or a very agitated, I won't say angry because it's not always anger, but it's agitation. Like you see in a washing machine, you know, it kind of moves back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You can see somebody become agitated when they speak about what happened. So I'm loving the new narrative that I see all over social media of people with lived experience talking about how memories are activated and how they then have to pull back that activation to be able to work, to be able to be with their kids, to be able to be in stuff that I take for granted, go to a grocery store. You know, um, after our discussion today, I'm going to walk across to a restaurant and have dinner. I'm not going to be worrying about danger when I go in there. I won't be activated because I am actually one of those lucky people who has never experienced a traumatic stress event such that I develop a post-trauma response. I don't have this activation button inside of me. So I'm going to just walk over there. I'll be safe. I'll look, you know, I'll make sure the parking lot's good. You know, but once I get in and sit down, I'm not going to be worrying about who's behind me because I'm not activated. Now, something might happen in the restaurant while I'm there that might trigger a concern. And then I'll look around a little bit more and I'll make sure I know where the door is. And, you know, then I'll be triggered to pay attention. I, I always know where the door is anyhow. I learned that much from you guys. So I, won't, I won't be looking for danger or danger avoidance because I will not be activated. Is that clear? That is very clear. So clear that when you spoke about leaving and going to a restaurant, I actually literally had a little bit of a shiver thinking about the amount of things that I need to look out for on that short walk. And that makes perfect sense. Perfect sense to me. I love the term being activated versus triggered. It's very clear to me right now. Transparently clear the difference. And uh, I appreciate that. Speaking about air quote triggers or being activated, one of the questions that I had a listener write in about was, let me see, one of the things I'm hoping to find future podcasts on are trauma triggers. There are so many levels of trauma triggers that I personally experience daily. As a child abuse survivor, DV survivor, a widow, and now coming up on my fifth year as a volunteer firefighter. When trying to type this message out, I wanted to express that I'm a CPTSD person. I'm not a victim or a survivor yet, haven't reached that level. But I'm eager to hear about trauma triggers. This is so important at this point in my life. So originally, Dr. Pam, I just responded that triggers can be very or activations can be very, very individual and personal based on your trauma incidents or your trauma experiences. I mean, obviously, I'm just kind of skimming the surface here, but how would you answer that in terms of trauma triggers? So 
in chapter two of my book, in my first sentence is, the first thing you need to know about PTSD is trauma memory. Trauma memory is different from any other kind of memory, and I hope that we begin to talk more specifically about trauma memory in this narrative, in this dialogue that we're all having. I don't see this phrase used much amongst my peers in mental health. I don't see the phrase used much amongst people with lived experience with trauma survival. And so in some ways, I'm not actually introducing this term because it has been used, but I'm elevating this term. So trauma memory is different from any other kind of memory, but it's same in some ways. Memory we form because we're in circumstances, just a little teaching moment here. So we're in circumstances with our senses active. We smell things, see things, feel things. We hear things. We might taste things. So we use our five senses as well as our emotional responses. So we call that a sixth sense, maybe like our intuition. And we experience the world like that and we begin to form a memory based on our senses. So what happens typically is the experiences that we have that have strong sensory attachments to them, like our wedding or the birth of a child, or the death of a child, or the death of our parent, or the getting a new job, or buying a new car. I'll never forget when I got my Mustang. And even now talking about it, it makes me smile. This is what memory does for us. Good memories. So I'm having memory come to me with all these senses. So typically, over time, our experiences become memory that we share with other people, And then they fade over time. Even grief fades over time. But what happens with trauma memory is that moment when violence occurs, changes happen in our brain. We may or may not develop a trauma memory, but the changes occur in our brain each time violence occurs. We go from relatively I'm okay to, oh my God, something fucking horrible is happening right now. And then that moment has smells, sights, sounds, feels, if that moment in time becomes frozen in time, it can become a trauma memory. So this is my phrase here. Trauma memory is a moment in time frozen in time. And these guys and gals, these 6,000 people where I witnessed them talking about what happened to them, I kept witnessing the impact of trauma memory. Trauma memory that could be closed for a while because you can avoid stuff that makes you think about what happened, but it's not just thinking about it, it's feeling it, it's smelling it, it's tasting it or hearing it. So you might hear an alarm sound that could pop open that trauma memory. Guys and gals from the war zone would talk to me about a certain siren sound. On the iPhone 8, for God's sake, there was a certain siren sound that somebody took. It had to have been from the bases in Iraq, Afghanistan, or maybe just in the military, where a certain alarm would sound that meant there were incoming rockets. Wow. Content warning here right now, because I just said something more specific about the war zone. And I won't go into any more depth except to say that that iPhone had a sound that activated that trauma memory. And then they're looking around, they're wondering, am I being attacked right now? They know they're not being attacked. No, but some people have severe post-traumatic stress reactions and they lose touch of whether that's happening or not. And depending on how severe the moment was, could create this more severe trauma memory activation, which we call dissociation. So my friend Virginia, who wrote A Soldier's Guide to PTSD, has said that she has never met someone with post-traumatic stress response that didn't have some periods of dissociation, meaning that the trauma memory would be so vivid that you think you're there. It like becomes the glasses through which you're seeing what's going on around you. And then, you know, we can talk in a minute about the symptoms that roll out from that. 
But when you're looking at post-traumatic stress, quote, disorder, the diagnosis in the DSM-5, or you're looking at operational stress injury and the list of symptoms that are associated with that label, the first two items is exposure to an event that is life-threatening in one way or the other, and then repetitive intrusive memories of that event. So that repetitive intrusive memory, the nightmares, are evidence of trauma memory. And the intrusions as well, I find, can come. I mean, I, there's incidents in my service that when they come, they just come back. It's not like I'm thinking of them. It's not even anything happened. They just seem to just come in. So I presume intrusions like that are fairly common as well. The intrusion of trauma memory. So I'm not saying this happens this way all the time, but this is one of the steps toward understanding what's activating me. How do I go from I'm not thinking about it to now I'm thinking about it? The intrusion is sort of this, what we think is automatic, but actually what it is, is you smell something, seen something, heard something, something that's inside that trauma bubble, that memory bubble, uh, that bubble of what happened that's so vivid, something has happened around you that pops that sucker open. Those are the activators. Wow. Like the some of the first things that you do when you're lucky enough to help somebody walk through this in a recovery process is you help them identify what those activators triggers are. So what are trauma triggers? There could be many different kinds of activators or triggers. The first ones to notice are the sight, sound, smells, are the five senses. What are you smelling? What are you seeing? That's what's going on around you. And why did that just pop open that memory? That makes perfect sense. That's something now for me to start investigating on my own because I feel I just come in at times, but there must be something that I'm not paying attention to that's activating that. In terms of recovery, when you mentioned that, one of the questions that a listener sent in as well was, what is the longest treatment time you've encountered in which you would say the patient is restored or functioning well in day-to-day activities? They had a follow-up to it. We'll just mention both of them at the same time here. We want to know as well if there's a connection to the amount of trauma exposure and the time it takes to restore a patient slash client to being able to function well in day-to-day activities. Lots of different people do post-traumatic stress symptoms, and I have a certain perspective on that. I don't think I have all the perspectives on it. But this perspective of looking at what's happening as a neuropsychological phenomena that has to do with a memory that gets embedded and repeats vividly. So we have this thing. It's been going on since we first started documenting this stuff in the late 1800s. You know, we've seen nightmares. They've been described by persons with lived experience, which is my way of referencing survivor or victim. I prefer the word survivor always, but I'm really liking my exposure and learning in the last couple of years to people with lived experience. So I am not a person with lived experience. So I'm watching people witnessing, not just watching, but witnessing, bearing witness to how they're experiencing these continued experiences, these hor- horrible moments in their life. So when I was working as a treating provider, so I was a treating provider really from 1990 to 2013, pretty actively, that was my dominant job. I love the work. When I was doing the work with folks, the longest period of time that I worked with somebody was five years. At the beginning of working with this particular person that I'm thinking about, I knew so little about how to be helpful. And this person was telling me so much about what they experienced. And I'm just going to keep it neutral so as to be respectful of their process. Absolutely. So it took me a while to see the, uh, that there was something being activated. 
And I have kind of a memory of a five or six month period when I would talk to this person and say, what just happened? So this was probably in 2000, 2001, you know, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I said, what just happened? And it would be a while before I could bring this person back into the room. And then I learned to ask this person to, I, I had this sofa that had these buttons, these brass buttons. And I asked the person, to rub those brass buttons until you're back in the room. You know, yeah. I hadn't read a book. I didn't know what I was doing. Nobody was talking about grounding at the time. Actually, I think people were starting to, but not in my circle. This was before you could search things on the internet. So I began buying books. And I mean, this was back at the time that the first books were being written on how to help people deal with traumatic experiences from their past. And so then I began learning about grounding. And this was the first time period in my work that I began talking to people about grounding. So what grounding does is it gives you a sensory experience in the present time that is contrary to the trauma memory sensory experiences. This is how I came to see it. Does that make sense? Perfectly. Absolutely. So when I hear people talking about grounding, that is immediately what I think. I think, come out of the memory. You know, your bubble's been activated. That horrible bubble has been activated. Close that bubble down by paying attention to what is actually going on around you, all the sensory experiences going around you. Now, I started reading about that and thinking, oh, yeah, that's what my clients are telling me. They're describing what's in these books that people are writing So I felt like I was on track. I was listening well because clients were telling me similar things to what I was reading. And so I started trying these things out, the different techniques for grounding, the breathing techniques. And so what is the longest treatment time? That would be five years. I just wanted to apologize for like years one through three. You know, (laughs) I think we just didn't know what we were doing. That's, that's good. <laughs> you know? I, yeah, no. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. For what it's worth to whoever's listening in terms of how long it is, I am in two and a half right now and still working. So one of the other questions that came in when it comes to recovery is what advice would you give someone who feels that there's been a stall in their recovery? Talk about what happened. That'll shake you off a stall. That's true. <laughs> so, yeah. but, but I'm not exactly recommending that. The other right Quick, first thing I thought of was take a break. Yeah. Dolls are okay. Yeah. Take a break. You don't have to beat this thing every day of your life. If you can, take a break from it. Rest from the memory. Rest from the recovery process. You know, you'll develop some strength. Maybe you'll get a little bit more sleep. One of my concerns about social media for people with trauma memory is that social media is so activating. I'm concerned that people going on social media would never reach a, what this person calls a stall, I might call a plateau. And I think when you get to a plateau, it's a good time to rest and reassess where you've been, where you're heading, if you want to take a break. His breaks are okay too. So when it comes to plateaus or stalling then, can people, in your opinion, actually make a full recovery from this injury? Bad things happen all the time. Right now, sitting here in this hotel somewhere in Florida where I am working this week, I can, in my mind, imagine a mile circle from out from me, two mile circles out from me, three mile circles out from me. And I know there are bad things happening in all of these concentric circles. I don't know how bad. I don't know those people. I don't know why something is happening, but I know things are happening to people all the time. There's a war in Ukraine right now. There are people who are experiencing the war zone in so many locations on the planet and at home. I think that recovery, quote unquote, is never about becoming trauma naive again, or trauma innocent. I don't think you ever go back to being the person you were before your experience. And that's hard. I like that. 
I actually really like the way you put that in terms of being trauma naive, that you go back to that sense of ignorance is bliss. I feel the same way. I really do. It's fantastic to hear that. I'm on a page that's somewhat right anyway, so that's good. <laughs> right? One of, one of the other questions that came in was wondering about your thoughts with regards to cannabis use and psychedelics such as ayahuasca therapeutically for post-traumatic stress. Do you have any, any opinions with regards to that or is that something that you have not necessarily looked much at? Well, just a disclaimer that I don't know as much about that as the people who are administering these treatments who I have respect for. I know a fella on Twitter who is working to educate about what psychedelic treatment is, how it works, what the steps are, how they keep things safe how persons who are engaging in that treatment, what kind of success changes they're experiencing. I understand some of it from the neuropsychology perspective. In other words, these psychedelic drugs are thought to interrupt the activation of trauma memory in some ways, that they're thought to interrupt that by enhancing the activity of other parts of the brain. So the idea that they have a neuropsychological explanation for what they're doing is encouraging to me. I have yet to see the kind of treatment outcome studies that would make me feel good about referring someone to that treatment. Um, but I do know that there are a lot of people in the MDMA, microdosing, other psychedelic quote unquote treatments that are happening. I know that there is a history of Native or Indigenous persons medicine where these substances have been used for hundreds and hundreds of years. As a person who is a licensed psychologist, I defer to the FDA. So at this point, I have to say for psychedelics, I defer to the FDA who has not approved their use. And that's where I'm at with it because of the work that I do. Absolutely. I would encourage you to get all the information. And I would also just like encourage you, like this is my little corner of CTS, is trauma memory and the neuropsych impact of violence exposure. And I would encourage you to know about that as you engage in any kind of treatment, including pharmacological prescription treatment by licensed persons who follow FDA guidelines. Even those kinds of prescriptions, I think you will uh, appreciate them more or know what you're getting into if you understand the neuropsychology behind them or the neurochemistry behind them. And so, like anything, you know, to me, PTS, trauma memory is like a cancer that takes people's lives. So study it like you would a cancer for crying out loud. You know, that's why I wrote the book. I'll just do a book plug here. I wrote the book because the folks I was talking to after thousands of VA benefits exams, I would ask them, have you ever Googled PTSD? Do you know what we know now about the neuropsychology of PTS, about recovery options? And the answer was always no. In 2019, I wrote the book. So whatever we knew in primary mental health primary psychology about PTS, I tried to include in the book. So I talk about evidence-based recovery programs and residential care and medications. And I actually touch on psychedelics. I personally don't have any experience whatsoever with psychedelics. I just, I know that I've heard a very frequent number of people talk about going on ayahuasca retreats and their use of ayahuasca along with meditation and breathing techniques, took them to a place that they found a great deal of peace. I have some experience with cannabis, which is legal here now, sort of seeing how that can work its way. And I'm, I'm really and truly trying cannabis primarily for a substitution for the amount of alcohol that I used to drink and I'm trying to curb. But my issue comes down to Dr. Pam is, I mean, as you say in your book lots of times, I mean, it's my mind needs to stay active. And if it's not active, it goes to bad places. And the worst time for me, which like a lot of my brothers and sisters, is bedtime because we lie there and there's this impending sense of doom 
with the realization that you are completely and utterly vulnerable when you are asleep. Personally, I all of a sudden start getting myself into a tailspin of thoughts that will lead me to hyperventilate, be anywhere but in bed, and just stay up and make sure everything is safe and everything is, again, that I have control of things that I'm able to protect. So again, the psychedelic side of it, no, but the cannabis side, yeah, I'm trying to find something that just gives me that. I'm so used to, or I was so used to my sleeping aid being essentially passing out. Um, that was how I would go to sleep. And I'm trying with cannabis to find something that still gives me some sense of being lucid, but also that my brain doesn't fire up on all cylinders, if that makes sense. Yes, sir. It certainly does make sense. Who would not want to stop this mind fuck from happening? Yeah, exactly. You that's know. exactly what my psychologist called it. Yeah. A total mind fuck. Yes. You know, that's the technical language for it. <laughs> <laughs> I typed as you were talking because I was wondering if you would walk through the symptom category for the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, because this is what people do. So again, I've been witnessing people talk about that mind fuck <laughs> for 15 years. Yeah. And I, I'm okay with that. I, I like the job. I can do the job. Because the activation doesn't occur for me as it would occur for someone who has a trauma history or trauma exposure. I don't get a badge for that, except maybe the lucky badge. So I don't get activated. So when I'm listening to someone, I can stay in my healer perspective and listen for what they're saying to me. So if you don't mind, I'm going to pick you apart for a second Let's here. Let's do it. Let's go. So you said at bedtime, you have an impending sense of doom. Absolutely. So criterion D for this diagnosis, and I'm not as familiar with OSI to be able to talk about it like this, but for the DSM, criterion D is negative cognition, like the trauma memory, the violence exposure, A, the trauma memory, B. We're going to jump over C for a minute. The negative cognition, B, impending sense of doom. So for a person like me who doesn't get activated, I'm going to look at you, if you're my spouse, and say, what the heck doom are you talking about? Because I there is no freaking doom going on in this bedroom right now. Yeah, Nobody's coming in to attack us, but the exposure and then the repetitive trauma memory, which pops open in your brain, convinces a person over time is this maybe this is the process that occurs that bad things are happening because the trauma memory is happening so bad things are going to just now another bad thing's going to happen another bad thing's going to happen but nothing bad actually happened but except for the trauma memory getting activated so in a sense your brain keeps tallying that activation and saying see how horrible the planet is this thing that happened keeps happening, keeps happening. An impending sense of doom. This is one of those, like when we're doing an assessment, I'm like, check, you know, like this is a line on the check box, yep, you yep, know. Yep. The next thing, the realization you're vulnerable when you sleep, criterion E, the hyper arousal symptom. So if I'm in danger, the thing that makes the most sense is to stay awake. Yeah. to stay alert, to keep watching. Unfortunately, that also makes you irritable. So that's one of these hyperarousal symptoms, like you stay on edge. Yeah, People absolutely. will often talk about themselves as on edge. Absolutely. You feel on edge? Yeah. I hate that. Yeah. Yeah. So if I walk across the street right now, and there's also a bar there, so I am going to have a cocktail. I'm not going to say I deserve it. I'm just going to say I want it. So I'm going to choose to have it. I don't think there's any deserving, not deserving involved in alcohol. Like that's one of my alcohol rules. You never deserve it, but you can choose it if you want it. So I'm going to walk in. I'm going to have a cocktail. I am not going to have a cocktail to take the edge off my edginess because I don't have edginess. Right. If there's trauma memory, there's going to be a, an edginess. And how do you talk? You can't talk stuff out of that. Because the impending sense of doom says that it's accurate. So you, the mind fuck, it just spins. 
yeah. you know, it's just spins. And God forbid if you calm yourself down from that edginess and then you hear a crack of a door closing hard or the security light goes on outside the bedroom, you're going to be looking at your phone to see what the cameras are saying. What they're saying is nothing. And again, if I'm your spouse, I'm going to be like, would you please put that phone down? There's nothing happening. Right. But I stopped having these arguments a long time ago with people. Yeah. Well, because yeah. this, you know, the trauma that keeps it going. But yeah, I was going to say, when we get to some of the things that you were just talking about in terms of, you know, your spouse is there saying there's nothing wrong, that just agitates me even more because all I can say is because you don't see what I see. You have not experienced, you don't know what's going on. I have the ability to accept what is logic, but I also understand that there's a part of me that's not accepting what is logic and that logic isn't always, here's, here's a mind fuck. Logic isn't always logical, although it is, it's just fucked. Right. And then you talk about going over, choosing to have a cocktail and you're just having one because you want to have one. Um, every day I would say I earned one every day. I earned this. And every day it was, I needed something to take the edge off me. I had to, because otherwise I remain in an agitated state. And that to me, it seems to be very common because one of the things that as well comes up on this podcast quite a lot are addiction issues or at least substance abuse where you're just trying to escape. And the reality is you're not going to escape using it. You get a break from it you're not escaping it. It's still there when you wake up. You just wake up feeling shitty. You had a shitty night's sleep and everything is still there that you have not yet dealt with or processed or spoke about, which to me just gives me a bigger reason why I need to drink the next day. And it becomes a cycle. Because alcohol slows down brain activity. It doesn't really put you to sleep. Going to sleep is not really a slowing down of brain activity. Like these are not the same thing. Right. Yeah. So going to sleep is actually a, you know, I don't you know, talk to a sleep specialist about that. I can't really go deep on that, but they are different. So alcohol can slow down your brain activity for like three or four hours. But again, what did I witness? What was the pattern that I saw people speak about? I stopped being judgmental a long time ago. So what, just what is the pattern that I'm seeing? And what I'm seeing is they're all waking up three or four hours later. It doesn't matter how much I drink, I wake up, and then you have to have more drink to slow down the brain activity because alcohol like has a half-life of three or four hours. That's all the time it can, unless you drink more. That's as long as it will slow you down. That's not a sleep pattern. Exactly. Yeah. Um, that's just slowing your brain activity. I get it. It makes perfect sense. That's why I don't judge. I get why you would not want to be on edge when you're trying to sleep for crying out loud, you know. But it does make sense. Now, I failed to make that correlation as to why, I mean, if I don't take some other sleeping aid, which is prescribed, but if I choose not to take that in a particular night, that I will wake up every time between three and four, every time. And I'll be lucky if I went to sleep at midnight. So that makes perfect sense in terms of the half-life of alcohol. Sort of one of the things I wanted to hit on is, I mean, I know that it doesn't get updated very often, but what is the failure for the DSM-5 to recognize complex post-traumatic stress? And do you see that as something being revised or altered in the future? I don't know if it will be revised or altered in the future. But what I know is that people experience complexity in their trauma response. So one of these questions was, is there a connection to the amount of trauma exposure and the time it takes to restore? There is a connection between whether you live in an environment that was traumatic versus, you know, an environment where everybody can be a jerk at times. And I don't want to minimize emotional abuse or anything like that. So let me just go back to we know that there are home environments that are infused with trauma. I'll just speak from my little corner here. To think about trauma memory and the number of negative, well, the number of experiences that a person lived through or survived 
And to be a uh, domestic DV is domestic violence. So when that's going on, that leads to a complexity of responses that is different from when you are an adult and you experience a violent event, and then you have a post-trauma response to that event. So living in a traumatic environment means that you grow up learning how to protect yourself from people who are supposed to care for you. And so that establishes patterns of behavior. I think the DSM used to call those personality disorders. I like that the DSM is moving away from personality disorders because I think you can scratch a little bit under the surface and you'll find a traumatic home life. So I don't know what the DSM is going to do, but that's what I perceive to be complex PTSD for people who grow up in home environments that are characterized by trauma. And then I know when someone's in a work environment like y'all, and there's this operational stress injury or the post-traumatic stress due to work-related exposures, let's talk about that separate because that develops a complexity based on number of exposures. So it's not as simple as knowing what smell is going to pop open, what smell is going to activate me, because it's going to be a lot of smells. Absolutely, yeah. It's going to be a lot of sound, a lot of environment, you know, that will activate memories. You talk about just the embedding in your environment too, and I see that difference in terms of the fact that this is where I've had to do my work. This is my air quote war zone that there's no differentiation between I arrested someone yesterday at the local grocery store and today I'm with my wife and kids shopping at the local grocery store. Right. I mean, that to me causes a lot of issues and that has to me as well made me, I guess, socially withdraw from a lot of situations such as going to places that are busy and I guess I get concerned sometimes about being recognized by someone who I don't want to recognize me and then be able to associate my wife and kids and, you know, knowing what it's like to police in a very small town where you're in a, a fishbowl, everyone knows where you live, what everyone looks like when you work, when you don't work, who's at home, who's not. I mean, you're just, you're in a fish tank. And so that has me to a point where, yeah, I guess it doesn't matter where you put me. If you put me in Los Angeles, I would still have that odd concern. And so I guess what I wonder is that would that type of embedment in the environment also, I guess, apply to, again, a person who, well, is policing or is a firefighter, is a paramedic. I mean, in their own, they live in that same backyard. Does that have that same effect, the embedding? Absolutely. I think so. And I think the idea of, you know, driving by the place. So let's talk about avoidance for a minute. So how do you not get activated? You start avoiding the things, the places, the sight, sound, smell, feels that are associated with your trauma memory so that it won't get activated. This is a rhetorical question you can answer if you want, but the stories I've heard repeatedly, like it's a a trend, it's a pattern. I hope you guys are talking about this. You drive different ways to get home so nobody can follow you home. You drive a mile out of your way to not go by the site of the car accident. You avoid the locations where things happen, and eventually, and I don't mean you personally, eventually, you move away because there is no avoiding. So being from Southern California, I often hear people say they're moving to the desert. Why are you moving to the desert? Because there are no people there. There are no stores there. I'm getting everything by Amazon. Thank God for the pandemic because I didn't have to see anybody. You know, it's like that avoidance. Why wouldn't you? But it steals your life. It makes your life smaller and smaller. And that's the part that bothers me for you, our first responders, and for our service members. While I enjoy the freedom of just casually walking across this parking lot to have a cocktail, y'all won't even... Well, you wouldn't even get on a plane to come to Florida to work for a week because there'd be too much activation as you went along the way. So it makes your life small. And that's what I don't want for people. It's a big, amazing world. 
as long as you don't have to look over your shoulder. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, it's funny you say flying because, I mean, well, I did never have an issue, but back in November I did. I think it was the time that we were there and it was extremely busy. And then my wife and daughters were with me and yeah. I had a meltdown in the airport. And so now it was on that same trip actually that I went and purchased these Apple headphones that are like, I don't know, I think they were five or $600 American. But I now take these with me as a child would take their favorite teddy bear. Because if I get to a situation where all of a sudden there's certain sounds that activate me, they're noise canceling. I put them on, I put on some music and I try to just get myself, I guess, down to a level of senses that I can more comprehend. I become overstimulated. So if I I can at least take my sound away, then I can only now focus on, for example, say smell and sight. And that allows me to be able to process that information as opposed to hitting a point where sound comes in and it becomes overwhelming. Yeah. And here I am trotting through an airport, not I'm knowing where the security guards are. I'm keeping my distance from people. You know, I'm doing some smart things, but I'm not. I don't have an impending sense of doom. I don't have a belief that something crazy could happen any minute. I have an understanding that something crazy could happen any minute, but I don't have a trauma memory popping open to remind me that, in fact, crazy things have happened in the past. And then suck me in. You know, like in the movies when somebody's being like shot in the movies, but they're a stunt person, so they have like a rubber yeah, yeah. a rubber pull on them that yanks them backwards. Yeah. So that's what I see trauma memory doing to people. It like grabs them, yanks them back, it yanks them into a, another time, another space when something horrible happened. That's not actually happening right now. And so not the insulting at all, you know, but to say that process shrinks people's lives. And that is what has kept me in this business for 40 years. I don't like watching that happen to people. I like people to be able to broaden their lives. And again, I will say this is why to a lot of people, you are a celebrity because you are very, very helpful. And in the book you have written again, PTSD Unplugged, is phenomenal. It's a perfect length as well. It's not, I don't know, I, I didn't find it encumbering. I didn't find it repetitive. I didn't find that it in any way, shape, or form bored me. I know sometimes I struggle with attention and short-term memory. And so there's definitely paragraphs that I went back over a couple of times to make sure I, I got it. But The book is, I can't say enough to the listeners out there, it's a fantastic read. I mean, so much so that, again, during my session today with my psychologist, I spoke about you, so she made a note of it as well. Dr. Pam, one of the questions that came in, and and I do quite like this one, is given the physiological changes that are now attributed due to, say, MRI scans, that there are, again, physiological changes in the brain, I mean, what's the likelihood that this is going to be reconsidered as a brain injury as opposed to a psychological injury? I don't think I can weigh in on what my profession is going to do about this. I will say that just in a sense of clarifying, my understanding is that we're seeing these brain patterns on sex scans or PET scans, which are different from MRI kind of as different from MRI as MRI is from CAT scans. So, but this is something that a person could look up. So if you want to know about this, look up PTSD and brain scans. And the first page of Google is going to give you the current knowledge on that. I mean, it'll be way more heady, you know, more um, academic, Um, but it is, it's fascinating. Now, I did go through a period when I was writing the book where I was like, maybe we should call PTS trauma memory disorder or something like that. I don't know. You always have to have what's the D for. The D is because it fucks up our life. Yeah. That's what it's there for. Right. You know, so uh, just to be honest, it stops us from being who we are. It interrupts our relationships. 
people outside of our head don't know what's going on. So they look at us like we're crazy and we're like, no, seriously, bad things can happen. Right. You, yes. Know? Yes. And, uh, yes. you know, <laughs> don't be an idiot. I'm look, I'm a cop. I'm yes. a former cop, you know, right. It's, whatever. I'm retired. <laughs> you know, trust me. Bad thing. And we're all like, yeah, we know we watch the news, you know, like yeah. we're bored or something. It's, yeah. it's cause we don't have that memory. So what happens is that when trauma memory is activated, your amygdala tells half of your brain to stop working and tells the other part of your brain to get working. The part it tells to get working is your protector defender self. You know, there's the part of you that survived what was happening is the part that the trauma memory says, get busy because we've got to get out of this. The trouble is it's not actually happening. So this is a brain thing. There is a neuropsychology thing that is going on in the brain, and we can see it like the switch gets flipped. So the thing about a PET scan or a SPEC scan is that these are conducted in real time. So you see the changes going on in the brain in real time. I've looked at them. I don't do them. I don't order them. I think eventually the people who are really smart about this stuff are going to give us a biomarker for PTSD. Interesting. And then we'll be like, you know, get a spec scan, and that'll show me whether you have PTSD. But what it will show us is whether there is a trauma memory being activated. That's what I think. That's not yeah. being proved anywhere. No, no. That's just me looking at 6,000 people going, that's activated trauma memory. Yeah. Or a person who's saying that might be happening, and they're talking about what happened, but I'm not seeing an activation. So right. I'm not seeing that survival person come out swinging or run away and go hiding or try to fight, flight, spawn, freeze. These are the four F, uh, yeah, the four fuck reactions to <laughs> violence. You know, we fight, we run, we freeze, or we try to make night. Nice. So that that person will stop what they're doing. And those are the four reactions we have when trauma memory pops open. So I don't know what it will be called in the future, but we've had this neuropsych information for over 10 years. Listen to me get pissed now. That's why I custom it. <laughs> because we've had this. We're on this path for over 10 years. And yet, We've not made a transition in the general understanding of what's going on with PTSD. We're still saying to people, you're not strong enough. You need to be strong. like there's something that you can be strong enough to resist being horrified by horrible things. No, just sometimes a trauma memory forms. And we don't know why yet, but I think the answer will come from neuropsychology. Very interesting. So maybe someday, I do think that will inform our diagnostics at some point. I hope I'm around to see it. That's very, very interesting. Very interesting. And another question, I think this might be the last one that came in. When you have a household where you have a married couple who both have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress and they're trying to navigate, well, I guess their symptoms while also those of their spouse, is there any tips for that kind of a situation. Yeah, I think in text I sent back to you, the, my best tip is to duck. Duck. I love <laughs> you it. know, duck. That's a just duck. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that's just because humor. I think we need to laugh more at ourselves and how we're reacting, but that might not be where either person in the couple is. They're not ready to laugh at themselves. So, first step to be a couple together with PTSD is really for both persons to acknowledge that they're being activated, not triggered, activated. I mean, it's hard enough to be in a relationship and not have your spouse's annoying behaviors trigger you to feeling annoyed. You know, but when your partner, your spouse is activated, that's a whole other situation because that activation what does it do? It activates the self-protective, the fight, flight, freeze, spawn reaction, the hyper arousal, agitation, startle response, the trust or mistrust, inability to trust somebody else. 
as far as safety goes, gets activated. So in a couple relationship, with all that activation on both sides, so important to be on each other's team and attack the problem. You know, so anyway, that was my favorite phrase from long ago, attack the problem, not the person. But the problem is the activation. I can't imagine what it's like to live in that kind of a situation. I mean, I find it difficult struggling on my own, let alone. That's got to be tough. I think it is because what activates a person, one of the things that activates a person is the feeling of danger. So if both of you are on edge, it's like your edginess can activate each other. So I don't have a lot of answers. The how-to book, you're writing it. You're writing it as you go. That's true. Yeah. So to that listener, I like that, Dr. Pam. Yeah, you are literally the one that is writing that book and maybe start noting those things that are helping you succeed in your relationship still. That's, uh, that can very well help people down the road. There is an app called PTSD Coach. The VA has written it and keeps updating it, and it helps you track your symptoms, what's going on today that these symptoms are happening. It helps you track the difference between your symptoms and other things. I recommend that app quite a lot because of that. It helps you track. And then you learn your activating times and other patterns. So as a couple, you might do that app together. That's kind of a neat idea. Yeah, I was just going to say with that information, you could actually see if there's any sort of a pattern to where you were in a particular day or what you were doing a particular day or what happened. That may actually be very good to me when we go back a little earlier in our discussion when I say that just I get these intruding memories that I don't know where they come from. And you had mentioned, well, it's something. Something is activating that. And perhaps, again, blogging it when it happens would help me identify what that little activation, what, what's causing the problem. That's, I like that. That's a good idea. I would love the opportunity at some point for our paths to cross and be able to meet you in person. I sincerely appreciate your time today. You're on the road. I know that we had spoke a little bit earlier and it's some things happened today that were unexpected and yet you still made time for this. I am so very grateful. Before we end off, is there anything else that you would like to add? You would like to say the floor is yours. You know, I think that really our future with PTS recovery is violence prevention and community interest and awareness of what our first responders, our service members, people who work in high-risk jobs do for us. So I have been listening to you all, and I thank you for your service. I thank you. And the way that you have a heart of service, like it's not you first, it's the protection, it's the being there for the community. And yet we're in a time period when our communities are divided about whether they trust first responders, whether they trust service members. I hate war. I want violence to stop. But bad things are going to be happening forever. We need to realize that. And we have a community that requires protector defenders and we need to stop thinking that we can stop the violence. What we can stop is not believing persons who speak of assault and we need to start trusting the integrity of the people who intervene. Now, I'm not saying that every first responder or service member is a person of integrity and high morals or whatever. You know, we, we need to stop being naive about the trouble in our community, but we need to come together as a community, all of us. So I'm a healer. You're a protector. We have bakers and cooks and builders and nurturers and parents and children and wise old people. We have communities and we need to come together and support one another, believe each other when we speak of horrific things that have happened, and support each other to find that peace again so that we don't lock these stories in small white rooms between doctors and patients. 
that's not the place for these stories. These stories are community stories. And it's a community that we need to end the stigma. So anyway, I'm getting a little bit, a little choked up right here. <laughs> so that would be my final. Yeah. I appreciate that so very much. And again, I love that you say that if you're going to thank for service, you need to be able to listen. And you certainly have listened a lot without people like you, there would not be people like me. And that's a reality because it would be a breakdown of the system. The other thing I'll say as well, with regards to your discussion and community, people truly excel and reach their highest potential when they are part of something bigger, when they come together and you are part of something bigger than just yourself. And that is a community. And so it's the sense of realizing that are there bad people that wear every type of uniform of any job? Yes, there are. However, that doesn't mean you automatically paint everyone in that uniform with the same brush. That's not how it happens. That's not how it works. And I agree that there has to be some sense of community that comes back with first responders. But I'll also say that first responders also need to give back to the community. There's been a breakdown there and that bridge needs to be built once again. Dr. Pam, thank you so much for your time. It has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. To everyone who has taken the time to listen, again, PTSD Unplugged, just buy the book. You can also follow Dr. Pam on, as you said, Twitter, Instagram, and uh, you have ptsdunplugged.com as well. You can find Dr. Pamela Hall. My name is Larry Payton. I have your six... Please also have more. Don't go away. There's so much left to do. So many things I want to say. And I sing Don't make the change. If it rains every single day, I'll fight to blow it all away.